My name is Rosalind Benjed. It's June 7th, 2002, and we are at the home of Andrea Weinstein. Andrea, your family's been in Dallas for a very, very long time. Can you tell us something about how they um, came to Dallas and where they came from? My father's family, the Waldmans, originally, uh, as far as we can, we, we originally thought they were from a small town called uh, near Tarnopol, a little shtetl near Tarnopol, uh, somewhere in that vicinity at any rate. The family came here just after, my grandfather came here just after the uh, turn of the century. And my uh, dad's three older siblings, four older siblings, Morris, Sam, Sadie, and Charlie were all born on Hester Street in New York. My grandfather, finding out that my uncle Sam had some, uh, some lung problems, asthma and things like that, was suggested that they leave the New York area and go west. So my grandfather got on the train and came west. And the train stopped in Dallas at about 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. My grandfather was Shomer Shabbos, so he would not get back on the train. And so he didn't, ever. <laughs> and that's how he happened to come to Dallas. So my father, Bill, uh, Willie, and my uncle, Irwin, were both born in Dallas. On my mother's side, my mother's parents. Uh, Hi, Andrea. This is Mark with American Solar Technology. Uh, once again, I want to thank you for calling Dallas. Okay, going. So, uh, my grandfather, Abe Waldman, uh, came to Dallas. Uh, it was Friday, three o'clock, when the train hit the depot, and he was Somer Chavez. So he got off the train, and he didn't get back on. And a few days later, I guess he must have called my grandmother and said, you're coming to Dallas. And so they did. Do you have any idea what year that might have been? Um, my dad was born in 1912. So that must have been, let's see, my Uncle Charlie was already born. He was, I think, about four years older than my dad. So it had to have been somewhere between uh, 1910, 1911, somewhere around there. I'm not exactly sure of the date. And on my mother's side, my mother's parents, my mother's family came from Russia, uh, Riga and Latvia. My grandfather and my grandmother were childhood sweethearts, which was most unusual at that time. And my grandfather, actually left Russia when he was about 17 or 18, actually uh, concealed in a hay wagon. And he went to Germany. And from Germany, we've only recently learned that uh, his entry into the United States was through Baltimore, not through Ellis Island, as was for so many, including my grandfather on the Waldman side. So my grandfather came to Baltimore to Chicago, where there was family. He subsequently sent for my grandmother, and they were married in Chicago, where my mother was born. Um, all my mother and both of her older sisters, no, her older sister and her younger sister, were born in Chicago. And they came to Dallas when my mother was six years old. So my mother has been here since she was six. Mm -hmm. And she was born in 1913. Now, after they moved here, did they have other relatives come and join them? My grandfather was the only member of his family on the Kessler side. That's my mother's maiden name, on the Kessler side. Actually, the name isn't Kessler, it's Kessel. But when he came in, it was changed to Kessel. And he had two older brothers, neither of whom came here. Uh, one um, one uh, went to Israel, and his family is, they're still family in Israel, still cousins in Israel. From that 
brother. Uh, the other brother, from what we understand, stayed in Russia and was lost. He and his family were all lost in the Holocaust. Um, on my dad's side, um, there was family, and still is family, we've discovered through a lot of genealogy work. But in terms of my grandparents, my grandmother and my grandfather, family came and were in the New York area, and there's still family in the New York area. But no one else came to Dallas. Uh, the, 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 the Waldman contingency in Dallas consisted of my grandmother and grandfather and the six children. And on my mother's side, my grandparents and four daughters, uh, all of whom really have, uh, well, some of whom, the eldest of my mother's sisters, uh, lived in Colorado uh, through, for most of her adult life. And then my mother and her two younger sisters uh, all lived here. Do you know anything about where your grandparents moved when they decided to stay in Dallas, where they lived, and what they did for a living? <laughs> well, uh, on the Waldman side, uh, because again, as I said, my grandfather not only was Shomer Shabbos, but he was extremely religious and um, spent a lot of his time doing uh, those kinds of things that very religious men do in terms of studying text. Um, he drove, or he didn't really drive, I guess you wouldn't say. He had a bread wagon pulled by a horse. He lived in South Dallas. Um, one of the probably very funny stories about my grandfather is that he got very frustrated with the horse once because the horse wouldn't pull the wagon. And so he, he lit a fire under the horse. <laughs> um, they all grew up in South Dallas. Uh, my mother's family, again, in South Dallas. My grandfather, uh, my grandpa Kessler, was a jeweler. And um, that's, that, was his, that was his trade. And uh, eventually, over the years, uh, had a little store across from SMU, Mustang Jewelers, and he and my grandmother. My mother's mother actually died when, when she was in her 40s, and my grandfather remarried, uh, really the only grandmother that I knew on that side. Uh, and they were a, a, a wonderful match, uh, he being well over six feet tall, and she being barely five feet tall. And um, he was the jeweler and took care of all of those things, and she was the one who ran the business. And where did you live when you were a child? I was, uh, my parents bought a little duplex on Revere, which is in East Dallas, right off of Skillman. And um, that's where, when I was born, that's where I lived. The duplex was shared by my dad and mother on one side, and my dad's brother, Charlie, and his wife, Ruth, on the other side. So my cousin, Dana, and, who was nine months older than I, uh, were both rather born at the, almost at the same time and lived next door to one another. Um, so we lived in East Dallas. Mm -hmm. I lived there probably till I was about, mm, I would say, two or three. And then uh, my parents, wanting to stay in that area, built um, a little house on Penrose, which was only about three blocks north of Revere, and again was uh, off of Skillman, and the house is still there, so was the duplex on Revere, and which I drive by often. So I, I lived in that house on Penrose until I was uh, 13 and then we moved into North Dallas. Mm -hmm. oh, was your neighborhood uh, the kind where children were, there were, were there a lot of children? Did you have lots of games and things to play with other children? Or? There were tremendous numbers of children in the neighborhood. As a matter of fact, I found a picture when going through them the other night of my birthday party. I was probably about five or six, and two of the kids at the birthday party were the long 
children who lived right in back of us. They also had three girls, and ultimately there were three girls in my family. And we played together all the time. My father, being an avid sports enthusiast, um, probably had some difficulty with the fact that um, there were three girls and no boys. Therefore, it was incumbent upon him to make sure that at least one of us became a sports person in the family. Um, I guess since I was the eldest, I was elected. So frequently in the summertime, there were baseball games in the street and lots of kids. Uh, it was a wonderful neighborhood. It was, um, um, in terms of being Jewish in that neighborhood, there were very few. But that didn't seem to make any difference. Uh, on our street of, on Penrose, actually was interesting, there were two Jewish families, uh, ourselves, and then uh, a family with whom we became very, very close, um, both of whom, actually the wife, was a Holocaust survivor. And her stories fascinated and at the same time frightened uh, myself and uh, my younger sister. Um, there were very, we were one of three or four Jewish kids in the school. Never seemed to make a difference. Um, Which school it, was it, your elementary school? I, first of all, I went to Robert E. Lee. Uh, I think my mother, quite honestly, was very anxious for me to be out of the house. I was, uh, I was a very, very busy child. <laughs> Extremely so, as a matter of fact. Uh, I was anything but quiet. I walked when I was eight months old, and that was probably a sign that things were not going to be good from there on. <laughs> she never could find me. Occasionally in the morning when she would wake up, and she was a very early riser, she would find that my bed was empty and I was no, nowhere to be found. That was because I had gone next door to the neighbor's house to, in, to engage them in conversation, have a little breakfast. Um, so my Janu birthday's in January. And at that time, you could enter class as a midterm student. So she promptly found that Robert E. Lee would take me. And it was not exactly around the corner, so I had to ride the streetcar to school. And um, the streetcar line at that time was at Mockingbird. Um, just the line actually ran just uh, east of Mockingbird. That was the streetcar line. So mother took me over to take the streetcar, and and those were the great days when you know you didn't worry about your child at six, riding a streetcar by themselves, and so she asked the conductor to you know that he he I was drop he was dropping me off at Robert E Lee and then I would get on the streetcar and come back, and I am told I don't remember this I am told that after the first day I told my mother that it was not necessary for her to bring me to the streetcar line, that I was perfectly capable of doing this by myself, and so I did. I went to Robert E. Lee for one semester and then was allowed to come to Stonewall Jackson, which is right there at the streetcar line, and spent um, the rest of the first grade through the seventh grade at Stonewall Jackson. Maybe this is time for the time for you to tell us about the fire. <laughs> Oh dear, and one of the more infamous moments in my life. I did several things that were not exactly sterling, but uh, probably the most unique and interesting was the fire. Um, obviously it was an accident. Um, I vaguely remember what happened. I've been told over the years um, that I, I guess at some point in time I finally did say that I had been the cause of it. Um, it was winter time. My dad would get up very early, and we had a, a furnace, a floor furnace in the living room, and then we had small gas stoves in the bedrooms. So he would get up and he would light the stoves. And I was an earlier riser than anyone else in the house. And I had a, a little toy broom, not a toy broom, a, a small broom. And I was playing with it and doing things and probably just pushing, you know, just, just pushing the button as far as I could go. And obviously it came too close to the gas stove. Well, uh, I 
took the broom and threw it in the closet and closed the door. And uh, everybody got up and quite some time later, probably, uh, I would say after bre late after breakfast, a neighbor called my mother to tell her that there was smoke coming from the roof and we had no chimney. So <laughs> that was a sign that something was amiss. And we also had an attic fan. Um, and my mother started looking to see if she could find the smoke. Well, what happened, the broom had obviously been smoldering in the closet. And when she opened the closet, it just, it just went. I mean, the oxygen just poured in, and it just burned, and it burned the whole house down. Oh my goodness! <laughs> um, we lived with my grandmother in South Dallas for about <laughs> six months while they were repairing it. The firemen came, obviously, and. Their assessment was that since the gas stove in the bathroom was adjacent to that closet wall, that something had happened in that way. I don't really remember telling uh, my parents that I had, you know, actually been the cause of this disaster. But um, uh, my mother tells me that I did. <laughs> <laughs> So the story has been, 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 been rather infamous. There were, there were a couple of things like that that I did that were unique. Mm -hmm. oh, what about high school? Where did you go to high school? Um, went to junior high at Long Junior High. Mm -hmm. And um, was um, rather unpleasant, shall we say, I guess is the best word to use, when my parents informed me and my sisters that we were going to be moving to North Dallas. Mm -hmm. The reason for that was that in the early feasts, the, the Jewish population, which had concentrated itself in South Dallas, had begun moving north. Many moved into the University Park area, and most started moving into this area, in Preston, the Preston Hollow area. Devastated, worst thing in my whole life can't handle this. I'm taking from all of my friends since grade school. I know all of these people. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? Well, okay, fine. Uh, I began Hillcrest in the ninth grade. <laughs> so I graduated from Hillcrest High School. And what kind of activities were you involved in in high school? I was involved in debate and in theater, which were my loves. Um, I was um, not considered um, a genius by of the imagination in terms of my academic abilities. Um, I did well. I did not do superbly. Um, I did graduate, however. Um, other activities, I, I was also very involved in, in BBYO, uh, the B'nai B'rith, in, in the B'nai B'rith girls, BBG. Um, ultimately, I guess maybe that was, I don't know, important of things to come. I don't have any idea, but I, I ran for my first regional convention uh, to be the chair of that and, and, and had that piece. Uh, my father was very clear that uh, one's activities had to be monitored to be in sync with what they were supposed to be doing in school, actually. So, but my favorites, my favorite parts of, of being at Hillcrest were the debate team, uh, um, individual events in that arena. And I did a lot of, of theater uh, with just the small, small, small theater groups that were really done through some of the BBYO groups. That was my favorite. Did your family attend the synagogue? Um, Sherith Israel has been the family congregation um, for, actually on my mother's side, um, my mother's parents at Sherith. Uh, my dad's 
father, uh, the little shul was a good zachim in South Dallas. So I can still remember as a child on the high holidays going to Sheriff, where my parents belonged, and then also going to services at a good zachim. So we went to both, but the Sheriff Israel has been the family congregation uh, now for us and, and for our children as well. Do you remember anything about what the congregation was like and the service was like when you were a child? The, um, I went to Sunday school. I did go to Sunday school. As a matter of fact, I was valedictorian of my confirmation class. <laughs> Much better in Sunday school than I was in regular school. Um, services, I, I remember mostly going to services on a Friday night, not so much on Saturday. Um, and I probably remember the Friday night services better. They, were, they, did, they weren't very long. It doesn't seem to me that they were long. Um, but the one thing that they did ask younger members of the congregation to do from time to time was to uh, read the prayer for healing. So that was the one thing that kind of rotated through. So I remember doing that. I also remember that the uh, cantor Kaplan, who was our cantor, Rabbi Weisfeld was the rabbi. Um, I always remember Rabbi Weisfeld because he was the big hat, you know, the big yarmulke. And he was always, you know, kind of doing this. He was always kind of in his way, I think. Uh, I don't remember a lot about him. I don't remember being overly swayed one way or the other. I was, however, swayed by Cantor Kaplan, who had a magnificent voice, beautiful, beautiful voice. He was tragically killed in an automobile accident several years later. Um, but uh, in back of the Cantor uh, was the men's choir. I mean, you didn't have any women involved at all. I mean, those of us who were young could come on the Bema, but in terms of any women participating in the service, uh, with the exception maybe on a Friday night of lighting the candles, there, 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 that did not happen. Um, I remember the very first bat mitzvah that took place at Sheriff Israel. Um, I believe the first was actually Judy Richmond. The second was my best friend, Barbara Angrist. And four of us served as her uh, lieutenants, and we walked her down the aisle for her bar bat mitzvah. Um, I was never bat mitzvah at that time. Um, and the only one in my family who could have been was actually my youngest sister, and my father didn't believe in it wasn't appropriate for girls, so mm -hmm. none of us were bought in How did your family celebrate Jewish holidays? Oh my. Um, <laughs> um, the one that is probably the most vivid in all of our memories, all of the cousins to this very day, uh, was Passover. It was usually at our house. Um, probably I think at the, at the, at the height, uh, there were somewhere between 40 and 50 uh, with all the aunts, the uncles, and the cousins. Um, my grandfather on the Waldman side uh, died when I was eight years old. So either my, my grandpa Kessler or my uncle Morris, who was the eldest of the, the Waldman siblings, uh, conducted the service. Rosh Hashanah uh, was always a family affair, always, you know, piling into the car, going down to the old shul in South Dallas. Services seemed to last for a month. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the fact that um, there was no air conditioning, of course, so especially in, in for the early holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, it could, it could be pretty uncomfortable. Uh, I don't think any of us realized it. I don't think we knew. Didn't, didn't compute, we didn't have it, so you didn't miss it. You were just knew you were hot. Um, the holidays were always wonderful. 
They really were. Um, Hanukkah was always interesting. Um, it was interesting because there were there were members of the family uh, who who had Christmas trees. Not in my house, ever. Um, we never uh, we had Hanukkah for eight days. One of the one of the very funny stories um, about celebrating Hanukkah and the family. Um, in my sister Linda's class, she was in the second grade at the time, and the second grade teacher uh, had asked one day, uh, how many of you have your Christmas trees? And um, so most of the class raised their hands, and so the teacher said, oh, don't worry, I'm sure by the time you come home today, you will have your Christmas tree. So my sister Linda raises her hand, she says, oh no, Miss Andrews. We don't have a Christmas tree. We celebrate Hanukkah, and we get presents for eight days. <coughs> My mother was the leader of the Brownie Troop, and <coughs> about um, two o'clock that afternoon, she started getting phone calls from mothers in the class. What is this Chanaka holiday? <laughs> What is this Chanukah holiday that you get presents eight days for? Because all of the classes now wanted to celebrate Chanukah. Um, <laughs> we had Hanukkah decorations. My mother made latkes, uh, and it, it was it was a joyous occasion. Um, it was interesting that as we got older. Uh, my parents established a greater affinity with the holidays, and I think with um, with Jewish observance and Jewish spirituality in general. Um, I think that had a lot to do with the fact that my, my dad became so involved at the synagogue. So what kinds of activities uh, were your parents involved with Jew in Jewish organizations? I never remember a time when they weren't involved in something. Um, um, my mother tells me that she was uh, working cards for Federation when uh, the, a gift of $10 was considered a good gift. <laughs> so that goes back a couple of years. Uh, I never remember a point in my dad's life when he wasn't raising money for something Jewish, uh, but not necessarily Jewish. There were other things too. Um, he was also a, a, a very active member of the Masons. And um, whether it was the synagogue, whether it was the Federation, whether it was B'nai B'rith, whether it was... Um, um, let me think. Jewish Community Center. Um, whatever organization existed, Jewish organization existed in Dallas, Texas at that time, they belonged to and were active in. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what, what did your parents do for a living at that time? Um, when they first married, actually, my dad uh, went to Drawn's business school. He was a stenographer, and as, as to the to the end of his days, he could still take shorthand. <laughs> um, my mother, um, my mom's, my mom's mom was a true artist. She was an incredible seamstress. She made. All of the clothes she had made her wedding gown. Um, she made my mother's, the, my mother, the veil and the little hat covered with millions of seed pearls uh, from my mom's wedding. And my mother inherited that skill. And so my mother's livelihood at that time, she was a um, a hat. Couturier. 
Uh, she worked for a woman by the name of Jacqueline Rose, who had her milliner shop uh, at the Melrose Hotel. And my mother was one of her milliners and made hats for some of the very, very wealthy socialites in the city of Dallas at that time. Ultimately, my dad went into the insurance business and that became his lifelong work, uh, having uh, eventually establishing Walden Brothers. So can you tell us something about your college years, what you studied and what you, your interests were at that time? I, um, I wanted to go to the University of Colorado. That was probably because we spent almost every summer in Colorado because my dad's brother, Sam, ultimately lived in Colorado. As a matter of fact, he was my husband's high school principal. Um, and my mom's older sister also lived in Colorado. So we would go there for, for vacations almost every year. Dad loved the mountains. But it was not to be the University of Colorado. Um, the tuition there was a bit much. So I went to the University of Oklahoma, being a complete rebel because everybody else I knew was going to Texas. And I decided that no, I would not do that. So my, my, my brief rebellion was to go to Oklahoma. I still am asked to sit in the closet for Texas OU weekend. <laughs> um, I wanted to, I, have a, I love music. I was very fortunate. My parents, uh, allowed me the privilege of studying the piano. And I studied for uh, just about uh, 14 years before I went to college. Uh, we were also very fortunate in that uh, uh, mother decided that we should learn how to speak well. So we also uh, took elocution lessons for many years and actually had uh, recitals in elocution at Lee Park. Um, so I studied the piano for many years and also loved theater. So my design was that I wanted to minor in music and major in theater. Uh, my parents said, um, no, you don't major in theater. That is not an appropriate major. Okay, all right. So I went to the University of Oklahoma uh, and t with the intent of majoring in, probably in English because I also loved that and minoring in music. They didn't have a minor in music, so I did what I wanted to. I took as many music classes and as many theater classes as I could uh, with a few English classes on the side and the other things that I needed to do. Uh, long about the beginning of my junior year, I realized that if I stayed at the University of Oklahoma, I probably would not graduate because I would just be constantly taking the classes I wanted and not what I needed. And I had made a commitment to myself my dad was very funny. He had told me all through high school, you have to, you, you're not studying hard enough, your, your grades need to be better, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. And um, the day I graduated high school, I, 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 I got a lens pen. I was not in the National Honor Society, but I did get a lens pen and I, I did fine. But I'm getting ready to go off to college and he says to me, you know what, honey? You go to college, you have a good time. It took me about I guess maybe a couple of weeks to process that statement. And I thought to myself, how dare you say that to me? You yelled at me through four years of high school and now you tell me to go have a good time? <laughs> so I'll show you I'm gonna graduate. So um, the second semester of my junior year, I transferred to SMU. And I graduated from SMU with a degree in English, a degree in secondary education, a minor in history, and a minor in French. And uh, so, uh, like most uh, women at that point in time in my life, I was destined to become a high school English teacher, which I did. And um, you've been involved in all kinds of Jewish organizations in Dallas. How do you think your interests started in, in that sort of well, <laughs> of course, um, I was no stranger to it, having grown up in the household uh, that I did. 
And I, I had, no matter where I had lived after, even in college I was involved in, in some kinds of things. And even when we lived in Denver and when we lived in Washington, D.C., um, we were peripherally involved and came back to Dallas. I didn't want to come back to Dallas. I was perfectly happy in Washington, D.C. I thought it was the greatest thing that had ever happened. Um, my husband, Lauren, who was born and raised in Denver, uh, had gone to school in the East. Uh, we had lived in Washington because he was working for the uh, Chief Counsel's Office of Internal Revenue there. And um, I thought, this is great. We're going to live here forever. And he said, I, I don't want to live here forever. I, uh, I really like Dallas. I said, well, what about Denver? Uh, well, you know, that's, a, that's an option. Well, at any rate, uh, we ultimately came to Dallas. The job that he sought was here. And I thought, oh boy, I'm going to come back to Dallas. All my family's there. They're going to be calling me every 15 minutes. They're going to tell me to do this, do that. You have to be here. You have to go there. So we've been here for about three months. Our third child was born two weeks after we came here. And about, I don't know, three months had passed. We were at Mom and Dad's for Friday night dinner, as we were. And I told my parents, I said, you know, after dinner, we really need to sit down and talk, have a serious conversation, fine. So we sit down, and I said to them, you know, Mom, Dad, you have been involved in everything for so many years, and you, you're, you're been, you've been wonderful, and you're so respected in the community, and we think it's wonderful, but we really need to tell you that that's, you know, that's just not our interest. And we, you know, we just, we, we just, we just don't feel that we're really going to ever be involved. <laughs> they didn't say a word. They didn't say a word. My father just kind of smiled and nodded his head. <clears throat> that was the end of the discussion. About maybe two months, three months later, I got a call, and I remember to this day, Sandy Kupfer and Helene Ray. Helene I'd known all my life, Helene Stein. As a matter of fact, she was at one of my birthday parties that I have a picture of. Called and said, hi, um, we have a group, it's called Younger Set. And um, we just wanted to say hi and invite you to one of our meetings. Biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> uh, I guess the rest is history. I went and somehow never figured out how to get out of it again. Do you think that's really the driving force? No. The driving force is being Jewish. The driving force is being Jewish. As I look back on it, I think, you, know, you say you're not going to be involved. The day you are born a Jew, you are born involved. That's it. That's it. Of the organizations that you've been involved with, what, what, do you, what, what work do, do you find the most challenging? I would have to say community relations. And I don't just mean uh, the organization community relations. I mean community relations. I think that's the most challenging. Uh, it's the most challenging because what you try to do is to allow people to bring their ideas and their thoughts to the table, and then find a way to um, have a positive outcome. And it doesn't make a whole lot of difference what organization that is, because that's at the base of what makes an organization happen and what makes it work. So almost any 
any challenge that I've had in any organization, it's always been in that arena to try to affect a place and a point of departure that produces a positive outcome. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of, of how this actually worked? Oh, let me think a minute. There are so many, um, but I think probably uh, a, a defining example uh, would be an issue that, that affects a community and the community and it can be so extremely divisive. And that probably occurred only a few years ago. And that was the issue of who was a Jew. And it was the great controversy in Israel, the great controversy in this country. And for us in Dallas, Texas, how do we deal with that issue so that everyone could come away whole? And that took tremendous community relations efforts in meeting with rabbis, and with meeting, meeting with community people to allow all of those entities, individuals, to air their frustrations with the issue on both sides. And then finally being able to come together and make a statement that allowed the community to be accepting of that statement and to allow a healing to take place. The issue's gonna come up again. I have no doubts as to that. But at least we found a place where we could come together and say, okay. You worked for Federation for a long time as well. And, uh, and, and as, as the community has changed, and you've worked on demographics too. Can you tell us something about the changes that you've seen in the community while you've been working with Federation? I think it's on, 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 on two levels, really. Um, first of all, having, having grown up here, uh, I saw the city move from something that was rather small and intimate, something that was rather large. Um, over the years, as far as Federation is, been, is concerned, um, you've, you've seen a, a, an organization that um, had, um, the purpose hasn't changed, the purpose remains the same, but the, the, the manner in which um, there has been a change in terms of involvement and the scope of that involvement by so many other kinds of people as opposed to what it was originally. It was a, not that it's not still, but predominantly, certainly in its, in its early stages and, and in my initial involvement, uh, it was very male, male dominated. Um, it was uh, uh, the women, the, the involvement of women in the Federation uh, was in the arena of the women's division, and at that time there was a women's board, a president, and a group of officers, and then you also had the fundraising part of that piece. And then you had the younger set, which eventually would feed into the women's division. I think the biggest change that I saw coming was uh, attributable to uh, a, a very important person in my life. And that's Ann Sikora. Ann 
Anne was a unique individual. Um, maybe it was because she was so tall. <laughs> And when she stood up, people would listen. Um, she began to understand very early on that this women's board, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was stagnating in a way because the president of that board never moved beyond that. Once she, she finished that job, it was, it was done. There was no moving into that big federation board. Uh, the woman who should have been there for 150 years was Fanny Shannon, and wasn't. But it was Anne who said, we're not going anywhere here. And so the move began to enable women in this community who felt strongly, not so much strongly that they had to make a difference in terms of the Federation, but that the Federation was missing an opportunity in not engaging women in this community who had a distinct role to play, other than just planning the parties and baking the cookies. So that's been a major change. Um, the Dallas Jewish community is a completely different entity than it was. Uh, we've been back in Dallas 30, almost 34 years than it was 34 years ago. 34 years ago, it was still a fairly small town. We did not have a tremendous influx of people uh, outside of the, of, the, of, of the Texas milieu. I mean, from New York and California and, and all over the place. Interestingly enough, 34 years ago, we started bringing in our very, very first refugees from Poland. Our first were from Poland, not from the Soviet former Soviet Union from Poland. And that was one of the first things in which I got involved, was in meeting them at the airport with your mother-in-law, with Mrs. Andrus, <laughs> who could speak Polish. And she would go with us because we couldn't speak Polish. And so that was, that was the beginning. So those were our first, uh, at that point in time, those refugees coming out. Um, over the last 34 years, with the advent of large corporations moving their, their offices here, you have a completely, completely um, diverse Jewish community. Um, when we did our demographic study in 89, 88, 89, um, we were we assumed at that time somewhere between 38 and 40,000. The demographics that had been done in the 70s, we were 18,000. So you already see the distinction there. Uh, we were more reform Jews than we were either conservative or orthodox. That probably hasn't changed a whole lot, but of course we haven't done the demographics in, well, now it's been obviously 10, 15 years. Um, we were, as the demographers called us, an odd duck. Uh, on one hand, we resembled uh, a community like Phoenix, and on the other hand, we resembled a community like Baltimore. So that begins to, to show you how, how diverse the community mm -hmm. has been. It's interesting, as I, as I look over the years, um, I remember um, Everett Rosenberg, when he was Federation president, saying that uh, one of the greatest um, challenges facing the Federation was in uh, having leadership, that there was a gap, that you had those leaders who were in their uh, 50s and 60s, 70s, 
but you didn't have the group in their 40s who were coming in to, you know, to make up that difference. Well, now I'm in my 60s. <laughs> and and I, I'm kind of looking at it, you know, from his perspective. And the change is, uh, and, and last night might have been a good example. Last night we had a, um, uh, a, a wonderful evening uh, sort of kicking off the Israel emergency campaign. And as I looked around the room of the 100 and some, 160 some odd people who were there, what was, um, I think, the best part of the evening was the age. And, it, and it, there were a lot, there were so many young faces there, men and women in their 40s uh, who, have, who, who, are, who are becoming major, major contributors, but also major activists in the community. And that's what, of course, gives a community its longevity. So the Federation has changed. It's tried to make itself more inclusive, uh, as opposed to exclusive. Uh, have a hard time selling that even today, but uh, that is the goal. And um, so I've seen that. I've, I've seen a lot of change to the good. Um, and it has been, um, it has been, I've, I've done a lot of things, it's true. But it has been the one thing that has allowed me to um, experience so many different things, whether it has been uh, raising, raising dollars, distributing the dollars, watching the foundation grow, community relations, Jewish education. Um, I've been very, very fortunate to have been able to um, be a part of, of the whole as opposed to the pieces, um, which has been which has been a real not only a privilege but a, a real learning experience. Can you tell us a little bit of something about your family today? Really, very fortunate. Uh, Lauren and I have raised three sons, and in spite of all of their shenanigans. We're both happy to say that they didn't do too badly. Um, they all live here, so we're really very fortunate. Never thought that would happen. Um, our oldest son, Jeff, um, is a doctor. He specializes in liver disease, hepatitis C. Um, he's currently the acting head of heptology at Baylor. Um, he is blessed with a beautiful wife. Debbie. Um, they met while they were uh, in college at Emory. Uh, she is the gymnastics coach at the Jewish Community Center. Uh, they in turn are blessed with three magnificent children. <laughs> Elizabeth, who is 11 and a half. Aaron, a girl. Uh, Whitney Aaron, as a matter of fact, her name is spelled A-R-Y-N, uh, who is nine. And Max, who is uh, who will be two in September. Uh, Greg is an attorney here. Uh, he's a litigator, civil litigator, which is very good because he always loved to argue, and definitely has found his niche. Um, Greg is the one about whom my mother said was payback to me for all the wonderful things that I did as a child. Yeah. He is blessed with a beautiful wife, Margie, who is also an attorney, um, who I must tell you um, is also Chinese and um, is um, a beautiful Jewish wife and mother. Um, they are blessed, of course, with three magnificent children. Alexandra, who is eight and a half. And Sam, who was two in February. And Sophia Rose, who was born the first day of Passover on March 28th. Our youngest son, Michael. Uh, 
does something that no one else in our household can do. I love to cook and Lauren loves to cook, but neither of us would be classified as a chef. So Michael is a chef at a four-star restaurant here in Dallas. Um, he has blessed us with a beautiful dog <laughs> by the name of Marley. <laughs> he also has a lovely young lady in his life. And you mentioned that Anne Sikora was a role model for you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other role models that you might have? My mother without question. Um, my mother um, one might think that, that she, she was in the background. My dad was always the one who was the outgoing, the comedian, uh, the teller of stories, uh, more visible in the community than mother. Um, but quite honestly, without mother, uh, I don't know that our home would have been as Jewish as it was because she made it so. Um, There was never a moment in time when uh, she did not, and, 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 and to a fault, cater to her children's needs. <clears throat> she, could, she could have demanded more of us and should have. <laughs> she was a fabulous seamstress. She made the draperies, she made the bedspreads, she made our clothes, she made her clothes. She um, uh, was known for feasts on a table that um, a person whose name will be familiar, Zella Sobel, uh, often said after eating at my mother's home one time, I'm going to learn to cook like Sadie Waldman. <laughs> um, she took us to piano lessons. She took us to school. But most importantly, I think the role model that she is to this day is her strength, is her strength. And of all your achievements, what are you most proud of? Oh my. I think probably seeing my children um, begin to understand that beyond their, their goals and their roles as husbands and fathers that um, there is a, a greater calling for them as well and um, that if in some small way I've contributed to that then that's the icing on my cake. Yes. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we turn off the show? I never thought that I would be sitting, first of all, I never thought I'd be sitting in an environment like this. Um, I sort of pinch myself every day when I walk in here. Um, I have been so fortunate. Um, I am married to a wonderful man who I only saw five times before we got married almost 41 years ago. Um, he has been, uh, we've grown up together in a way. We married when we were 21 and we've grown up together. Um, he's made a life, a beautiful life. My life beautiful.
Thank you so much.